forget to do that later. Um, and yes, hi everyone. There we go. See, I knew more people would come. Okay. Hello, welcome. Hi folks. So great to see so many people. This is awesome. All right, can everyone, like, if you can hear me, can you give me a thumbs up? Let's just make sure we're doing it. Yeah, awesome, rock on. All right, and then I will also open the chat so I can keep an eye on that. So if anyone does have any trouble with anything, feel free to use the chat. Um, so I will have that up and I have this up and everyone is already muted. Look at this. These are like pro people already. <laughs> That's the one good thing Thank about you for being so pro. Yeah. having to like do so many Zooms and so many Google Meets is like people actually like have the routine now is so much better than it was a year ago. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So yeah, I'll keep an eye on the um, the participants marry so i'll okay. i can make sure to let people in um if they come in while we're starting but i can just say hi to everyone thank you so much for joining us i'm carla corcoran i'm one of the program managers for the three mfa programs at the hartford arts school um i'll be doing the whole moderation thing and keeping an eye on the chat um and i'm so excited to introduce, and some of you may have already spoken with Mary Mattingly, our interim program director this year, while our founder, Carol Padberg, is having an amazing time on sabbatical. She, if you don't follow her on social media, I would certainly suggest it. She is having a ball with her sheep and her weaving and all the things that she's doing. It's it's pretty nice to to watch that taking place. Um, but Mary is stepping in and has already done a fabulous job with setting up our curriculum for this year. We are going to New Mexico in just over a month and um, she's been doing a wonderful job at the helm so far this year. And so she's gonna give you a wonderful little overview of the program and talk about the curriculum a little bit. And then I'll get into some of the more nitty gritty things about the application, but then we're really just gonna open this up and have it be more of a conversation with everyone. So if you have specific questions, um, again, feel free to use the chat if you want to, but we'll also have you on mute and just talk to us later. So whatever works for you all. Thank you again for joining us. I am recording this in case anyone does have technical difficulties. If the sound goes out, if you get disconnected, um, I'll obviously let you back in the room if you reconnect, but um, we will also have the recording for delayed viewing if necessary. I think that's probably all the housekeeping. So I'll give it to you, Mary. Thank you, Carla. Um, so yeah, my name is Mary Mattingly. I've spoken with some of you and some of you I'm meeting for the first time today. Uh, for some of you, this information will be brand new and some will know a little bit of it. Um, hopefully you'll have questions as we go through it, but for a brief run of show, I'll start with an overview of the curriculum with a focus on the pedagogy and the philosophy and an overview of the courses. And then I'll hand it back over to Carla and we will go through any questions that you have. And of course we have questions that we get usually, so we can start by answering some of those if and if at any time you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, that's great too. So NOMAD was founded by Carol Padberg here at the University of Hartford as a response to an art education system that was too siloed by discipline, really um, neglecting the interdisciplinarity that is really apt for today. So Carol wanted to build a program where artists not only work with scientists, but also holders of traditional ecological knowledge of organizers, craftspeople, technologists, and artisans, people who bring together disciplines in the arts. So I look forward. So I think it's a good idea to just begin with the fact that this is an MFA program that's based in socio-ecological systems thinking. So the merging of social and non-human systems, it's based in permaculture and the technology spectrum, as we like to say, from craft to code. So from your pencil to your Arduino and anywhere in between. Um, our ethos is to provide a rigorous education that's also experimental, 
but that's holistic, that's high impact, especially during those summer and winter residencies uh, that I'll talk about later. And, and also fosters collaboration and risk taking all within a field based curriculum. So this curriculum happens out in the world. And that's very, that's a really important part of, you know, how we do things. So we actively work towards ways we can make education more accessible and interdependent. And part of this has to do with how the program and facilitators work ethically within a community as a visitor and as a guest, and how we learn from ecologies embedded within the materials and tools that we rely upon, how we embed work around anti-racism uh, and privilege, around solidarity economics, around interdisciplinary research methodologies and integration of art and life uh, from artist practitioners into the curriculum from the beginning. So the Nomad MFA really foregrounds regenerative culture, which highlights models of abundance rather than the model that we're so used to seeing of scarcity, especially in, in the arts, um, in the art world, I should say. Um, so this is an image of a, us in Hartford working with Will Deleese Bermudez, who is addressing the policies towards the use of drones in Hartford. So that's a, a class that was about making change both inside and outside of structures, of structures of power specifically. And this field-based educational philosophy has its roots in reciprocity. So the communities that we've been able to visit, we've been cultivating long-term relationships with, and we aspire to really give and receive with and to build wellness together through that reciprocity, but also through sustained longevity. So Hartford is a good example of this. And also Albuquerque, New Mexico, where students are heading in January. And I'll probably keep talking about that because I'm so familiar with that as we're working towards it every day. But a field-based educational philosophy also affects how we learn. So we focus on reading and writing while simultaneously participating in really hands-on dialogic work. Um, and then making and thinking together often in these collaborative learning environments during the intensive residencies. So being field based, uh, we can really deconstruct a typical classroom. So here you might find yourself in the top left image in an ancestral space or in the center image in, in a site like a museum where an artist is making a new work um, or in the, in the image on the right in the home of writer Linda Weintraub on her farm in the Hudson Valley, or in the lower left, a workers co-op here with artist Caroline Willard in New York City. So you might be engaged in learning practical skills with them from budgeting for large project proposals to speaking and writing powerfully about your work to really hands-on making your own tools with, with Linda Weintraub. Um, or Back to the first image again on the on the top left, you might find yourself learning how to honorably harvest clay with Roxanne Swenzel. And this is a, a slide of a general overview of how the curriculum rolls out. So you have the summer and the winter intensives. The whole program is 26 months. Um, and then you have three summer intensives and two winter intensives. And the summer is three weeks and the winter is two weeks. And I will return. I'll return to the uh, give to give you more information about each course in the in a slide, but a uh, couple slides away, I think. So um, the residency sites that that we continually go back to, and and I'll mention that some of these um, change every once in a while. So we might add another site, and and we might um, forego a site after a while. Especially, you know, that's something that we've learned with with the pandemic. Um, which has made it hard to visit a couple of different sites. And, um, but yeah, it's uh, three weeks in the summer and then the, and then the two weeks in the winter. In the summertime, we're usually in Hartford for at least one week and that's for graduation. Um, but, um, but the summertime also varies and we do spend time in upstate New York um, and in the area around Hartford. So this is an example of part of a two week residency that would happen in the winter semester. This is in Oaxaca, Mexico, where students worked with Demetrio Bautista Lauzo to make different colored dyes from leaves, from indigo, um, flowers, lichens, and cochineal. And uh, then the second week, we're working with 
contemporary artist Pedro Lash on an art exhibition in Mexico City with a research base assignment where Pedro um, credited the students as collaborators um, in the end. And in between those two intensive courses, students had critique class with their thesis advisor. So their th thesis advisors also came to Oaxaca and critiques happened in Oaxaca in between those two intensive courses. So while you're in the spring and the fall semester, you'll meet with your thesis advisor every three weeks for one-on-one -on -one meetings that are about an hour long, and you're in constant touch with your other student cohort members. And then you have an art history class um, and a writing class that sort of continues in the spring and the fall semester. Um, and then students, how does it work? Students join Nomad from as far away as Saudi Arabia and Ghana and France and all over the US. Um, and because of course the program travels um, in the summer and the winter, artists have the flexibility to stay in the place they live in. Uh, travel is also a, a very important part of this MFA. It really allows us to co-learn different ways of being in practice. So for instance, again, this winter, we'll visit artist Paula Wilson and Kara Zozo, and we'll see the space that she created with her partner called MoMA Zozo. It's a residency program in a town of 600 people, well, where now 60 of those people are artists. So it's, a, it's an interesting community in New Mexico about two hours um, east of Albuquerque. And it's also important, I think, here to point out that we really wanna be sure that we're not only attending to the intellectual learning, but also to the well being of students, artists, and faculty. And this means we can't forget, and staff, and this means that we can't forget about our bodies and our communities while we attend to our minds. And we understand that these things aren't separate. And this is not the way every program functions. And it's something that we're constantly working on. Um, and we are honored to work with an extremely talented and generous and respected group of faculty that are based all over the Americas. And for continuity, you have two thesis advisors that work with you the first year and the second year, um, but access to uh, different artists and practitioners from around the Americas, and especially in those residency periods. Uh, but those residency periods, as I'll talk about later, also tend to extend into the rest of the year, um, sometimes with assignments and sometimes with follow-up with those artists. So just a quick rundown on the, on the courses. So, Art in Place, you'll see it on the left, um, is, is a reoccurring class. Of course, every time it repeats, it's with a different professor, often in a different place, learning a different set of tools. Um, so we see what artists and leaders and cultural members are doing and share and learn from that and sort of take that in and, and make that part of our toolkit. And then Techno Lab is a class where we focus on materiality and that craft a code spectrum that I was mentioning earlier. So it could be co-producing a podcast with artist Christy Gast on Seos and the New Museum, which was a recent project we did last year, or working um, on code-based programming for wearable technology or learning backstrap weaving techniques in San Salvador with Claudia Vega. So it's a, it's, it is a range. In the Distinguished Practitioner course, students might work with artist Pablo Holguera at the New Britain Museum on a project or co-design a naturalist shanty with Mark Dion, which we did last year during the pandemic um, when we weren't able to meet on site, but when we had uh, daily meetings every day on, on Zoom with, with the artist Mark Dion. Um, Creative Economies always focuses on rethinking value, time, and shared resources through a solidarity economics perspective. And that's with Caroline Woolard and uh, others who Caroline brings into the class. Uh, methodologies and contemporary art is this ongoing part of Nomad strategy for learning art histories. In art history research methodologies, you reflect on your practice and frame your work within the context of other working artists. And, in writing art and agency, the techniques we use really focus on peer learnings and accountability in those writing strategies. So we want students to challenge each other and for the writing process to be iterative. So you work with your professor who could be Billy Lee, Ricky, Tuck Ricky Tucker, or Jamie Hamilton Ferris. And also you work with, um, with the other people in your cohort who, who do um, check in with you as the class goes on. 
And River Lab is a course I teach, and we look at the idea of river restoration through a more bureaucratic lens. So through reading about creative research methods by Helen Kara and studying some form of river restoration plans set forth by the scientists and the ecologists um, in, in watershed communities, or sometimes they're set forth by entire cities in a city plan. Uh, we then interrogate that form and look at it through an artistic lens, and we ask the research question that we might idealize or that we might be curious about. So an example of that from last semester was what kind of line is a river? And the artist Jess Blaustein was, was trying to imagine what a river line looked like as she walked it every day um, outside of her doorway in the, the, where the Hudson River was. Um, and finally, focusing on your own work with your thesis advisors, which happens throughout the 26 months. So although the residency times are relatively short and intense, we assign pre-residency prep readings and also many course assignments carry on after the time that we're together in the residency. So those um, could be, for example, a web development assignment or bookmaking or research notebook assignment. And you might meet with your professors after the intensive residency on an artwork, on a magazine, making, we've produced mag, a magazine before after class or other knowledge sharing platforms. Um, and so we learn about maintenance and longevity and it's important, I think that the work that we do stays in the world in different ways. So some of the courses have also contributed towards community building together. Um, I was thinking about a newspaper on seed sovereignty that we were able to make a couple of years ago with the collective seed broadcast as one of those things. And then finally, I think Nomad is an ecosystem. Regenerative art and culture is intersectional. It builds space between social practice as well as ecological art, craft art, science, art and science hybrids, um, performance art, dance, sculpture, painting, photography, political art, eco-feminist art, other forms. Um, the curriculum looks at permaculture design principles like the ones listed here and asks what is an ecosystem in the Anthropocene. So art from a polluted creek reframes the creek as something in between or an earthship home we visit gets its materials from the earth but also from the landfill. And I'll hand it over to Carla. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, let me yeah. just uh, awesome. stop my share. Okay. There you go. Great. So that was a wonderful overview and a perfect segue um, to talk about the application because when you have an interdisciplinary program where you're going to have artists coming from all different disciplines, how do you best showcase your work? How do you best communicate your art practice to the admissions committee so that they can really understand why this program is right for you? And I will just share real quick, I'm not gonna do a whole Sherry thing, but, um, and of course I lost it, where did it go? Sorry, hang on. I'm supposed to be the techie person and yet, okay. So you might have seen our um, field guide website, um, which is nomadmfa.org. Um, and this has a lot of information about our program, our curriculum. Um, and so I specifically want to just draw you to over here under the details and um, the how to apply, because we've really tried to spell out what you need for the application really clearly. So under this submit area, it kind of lists everything that you're gonna to need to do to prepare. Um, we need official transcripts, even if, you know, and so I saw a question from the online form about the age range of our students. And we've literally had students from their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and we have a 70 year old right now. And so, even if you went to school many decades ago, we still want to see that you got an undergrad degree. So I know that can be annoying for some people, um, but we're happy to help work with you. The grad admissions office can also help work with you on that because um, we can take hard copies or we can take digital transcripts. Either way is fine, um, but we do need to see that you have 
some sort of undergrad degree. Um, and so yes, this grad study at hartford.edu, that's the main university graduate studies admissions folks so they can help with a lot of the technical stuff that is you know beyond just the programmatic stuff that we deal with here um, but usually we can answer the vast majority of the frequently asked questions so feel free to always start with us but if there's something tricky like i need help with how to get my transcript you know they're the best people for that um, so you need to get your undergrad transcripts we the letter of intent that we ask for is actually a really um, important piece of what the admissions committee looks at because talking about your practice and why this is the right program for you at this time in your practice really does affect how they see your work and they see what you want to do. Um, you know, we've had people who professionally were a curator and hadn't really done their own work for many, many years. And so, you know, they had older work to demonstrate in the portfolio, but by talking about, well, yeah, but this phase of my career has been X, Y, Z, and now I'm hoping to do this other thing, blah, blah, blah. You know, it really helps contextualize that so we can understand what your vision is. Um, so definitely don't skimp on that. I, I, I definitely like to encourage people like take a time, like really write and communicate with us. Um, your resume or CV, hopefully you have that done already. That's an easy one. Um, so with the references, um, just to clarify, and I, and I probably should have started with, so I apologize if I'm jumping around a little bit, but um, so we have this January 15th scholarship consideration deadline. And so anytime that you submit your application that before up until January 15th at like, you know, 11.59 at night, you will be automatically entered into the pool of people who are not only reviewed for admission into the program, but also for scholarship consideration. Um, scholarships range from, you know, 10% of tuition up to 40% of tuition. And it's really based on merit. It's not based on need. It's you know, literally what the committee is seeing in your application that determines the offer that you might get. Um, so if you're kind of running up to that deadline and getting all of your pieces together to submit for that January 15th deadline, because you want to make sure that you're in that review pool for scholarship consideration, you can just put in your reference people and you can just put in the request for your transcript. Those two documents, because other people are involved in it, not just you, we understand that they might come after the 15th and that's totally fine. Don't stress about it. As long as you've submitted the request, we know who your people are. We can, we'll keep bugging them to submit their letters of recommendation. And, you know, you might have to follow up with the undergrad institution or whatever, but so the January 15th deadline, it's all of the things that you're responsible for have to be in by then. And then if these other pieces come later, totally fine. You're still in consideration. Don't stress about it. Um, so the portfolio, again, depending on your artistic practice, again, we've had performance artists, we've had painters, muralists, we've had curators, we've had writers, you know, there's a lot of different things. And so how do you showcase that the best? How do you present that to the committee? Um, so the, as you can see here, the t either 20 still images or 20 minutes of time-based content or a mix. You can have both, totally cool. Um, a lot of times people will actually like make a PDF document that has different, you know, images in it and upload that one whole thing or do it slide by slide. However, it's going to present your work the best is fine. Um, you'll see as I get down here, um, I will also point you to where the actual application is, um, you know, but if you do have these, you know, time-based things or even, you know, high quality documents, you know, we can take up to five gigabytes per thing and all these different formats are accepted. So again, it's really whatever works best for you. Um, we don't want just like a link to a website though, or a link to a YouTube 
channel. That's not going to be as useful for the committee. We'd love you to somehow embed it into this like package of the review. It makes it easier for them. But at the same time, you know, people do list their websites. People do list, you know, these other supplemental things and that's fine. And we'd love to see it. We'd love to get a holistic picture of who you are and what you're doing. Um, and so normally the application comes with a $50 application fee, but because you're here joining us today and listening to us ramble on, I'm gonna give you a waiver code so you don't have to pay that $50 fee. Um, and we have something in the chat that has popped up. Oh, never mind. Okay, so um, yes, so let me go back here. So from our website. Oh, and I just made it into a new window, didn't I? Okay. So from the hartford.edu site, and I will actually go back to the beginning, hartford.edu slash nomad MFA. We have a nice little shortcut. So it takes you right to our page. So you don't have to deal with the web <laughs> that is the whole university page if you want to get right here. And when you get right here, this has a lot of great information. This links to like the most updated tuition information and fees and deadlines and all of that stuff. Um, but right here is the apply button. And this takes you right to the digital application. Um, and it's really not that bad. It, it really does walk you through it. As long as you actually like read the instructions and just don't skim everything, it really does give you pretty much everything you need step by step. Um, it'll alert you when you've missed required information, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully you can figure it out. But if you don't, we're here to help. Um, definitely a big part of my position as the manager is to support incoming students, support people who want to learn more about the program, and sometimes it's even troubleshooting the application. So um, I wanted to just point out those few things, give you that. Um, but I think that's most of what I wanted to say. And yeah, we could absolutely just open it up for questions and conversations. So I would certainly encourage you to turn on your camera if you want. And if people want to just, if anyone's ready to go and you're brave enough to unmute and just ask questions, we'd love to talk with you. Hi, I'll go. Um, do you know where the residencies will take place for the next um, group? Not for sure yet. And a lot of that is simply because of COVID and everything going on. The university has had to keep revising policies and, you know, make, keeping people safe. Um, for example, the photography MFA program, which is one of the other two programs that we manage, they wanted to go to Berlin this April and the CDC just changed them to a higher level mm -hmm. of, you know, travel warning. So it's, now seeming like they can't go, but in a month from now, maybe they would say yes. So there's definitely a lot that goes into it that is unfortunately, you know, stalling some of our planning. Um, but it would likely be one of the places that we have visited before. I don't think in the time of COVID, we're going to try and visit a brand new location and, and set that up. I mean, one of the great things about revisiting sites is that we have people that we're familiar with and know us and, you know, we can really dive in deeply. So um, I don't know, any other insight, Mary? Well, um, I know that Carol has been talking about Oakland and I'm not, and I know that's one of the places that is on the agenda for thinking about for next year, but it's, yeah. Yeah. You're okay. right, it's not a new place. No, no. So yeah, Oakland, Miami, M Minneapolis, would probably be in the next rotation generally. But I mean, we certainly want to go back to El Salvador and we certainly want to go back to Oaxaca. And I know she's talked about also like Vancouver and like other new places that are still in the Americas. But yeah, I I like we don't know what's going to happen with the world. And that's kind of a little bit of a problem. Right now. Yeah, we you usually know. plan for two, two, two places a year out and then narrow it down. Yeah. Okay, 
Yeah, Maddie. Hey, hey. Um, so obviously this is. Sorry, I'm at I'm at school. It's a little loud outside, but I have a question about. So this is a low residency. Um, what's the weekly hour? You know, commitment is it normal for you know students to hold jobs? I work in as a substitute teacher, and I was kind of curious if it's normal for someone to you know, hold a full-time position like that? Or is it more likely that someone will work, you know, 10, 15 hours a week or not at all? Do you want to go, Mary? Sure. I think, yeah, there, we, we do um, have many students who work full-time and um, do their low MFA and um, request time off for those residency periods. So that, so you would be looking at probably five weeks off during the year. Um, and we try to stress that we want you to spend nine hours a week in the studio or with your with your practice. And that's during the spring and the fall semester. And that like varies per person and you, your class, um, your classes in the spring and fall semester are there that one-on-one -on -one meeting with your, um, with one professor, right. With, with your thesis advisor. And that's every three weeks. And then you have this art history class that's um, dependent on everyone's schedule in the class. So usually what the professors do is they'll do a poll before the class and figure out the best times for a class. Um, and then, yeah, so the, the summer and the winter are more intensive and you kind of need to take time off for those. And then the spring and the fall are flexible. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that a little bit, um, you know, we've, yeah, we've definitely had students who have had full-time jobs, full-time commitments that they have, that families, we actually had somebody have their child be born while we were on residency, and he had to leave a couple days early to go home and be with his wife, you know, and so like raising a small baby while they're in this program working full-time. So, you know, we completely understand that that's a reality, and that's one of the beautiful things about low-res programs, and that's why they're becoming more and more applicable for people's lives, because you can't always just pick up and move across the country for your grad program. And so by being able to like stay, have your income, have your family, all of those things in place, and then also do this, it really does work for people better than a lot of other options. It is a full-time grad program though. I mean, that's the thing that it, you have to know that you're going to need to allocate the time for it. The thing is, you can allocate it when it's good for you. It doesn't have to be a nine to five thing. You know, like you could totally have a job and then do this at night or on the weekends, but we are expecting you to be a full-time student. So you have to find the time for that, but it can be on your schedule. So that's mm -hmm. the thing that I know people have, and everyone works it out differently, but it's totally plausible. I know Maddie had a question as well, right? Yeah, hi. Uh, I have two questions. One's going off of that is, are the one-to-one -one meetings on Zoom? And is that where you show um, your portfolio? Like, do you show work with the camera? And then my second question is about language, uh, like in traveling to places where there's other languages, uh, how does that, work and is it possible to take language classes through Hartford too? So Mary should totally answer that first part. The first part, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not, yeah. So the, um, I'm not sure about the language courses, but I, I do believe that there are, there are options um, through UHART. Um, and yeah. Okay. <laughs> so go back to the, yeah. Answer the other part because I can talk more okay. about like the library resources and stuff. But so yeah, talk about because yeah. you guys do like a PDF. Something we usually ask students for a PDF. Um, we also do have critiques mid semester, and that's a, that's something that we sort of and and this is me speaking for myself and for Christy Gast, who's the other thesis advisor, and what we try to do is find a time that works during the middle of the semester for, for that every student can meet during and we do critiques and that's a group Zoom. It's sort of like this where, you know, there'll be 10 people on a group Zoom and we, we screen share and that takes 
all day. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's two half days. Um, besides that, it is just those one-on-one -on -one meetings that you're, you're screen sharing or you send a PDF in advance. And that's how it usually works. So yeah, from the university side of things and, and the language side of things. So yes, I only speak English and I went to Oaxaca and it, it was mildly challenging, but at the same time, you know, if you're a well-versed traveler or if you're somebody who is open to these new experiences, we've had it work out fine. We also have had hosts that we work with locally who kind of are almost a travel agent or a guide and they help us. We've also had um, students who then like speak lang speak the languages and have been a wonderful help when we're just like going out to eat somewhere. Um, you definitely have to have like an adventurous travel spirit. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> like that's a big part of, of being successful in this program. Um, but yeah, the one of the benefits of still being part of a larger university is that you are still a full-time grad student, even though you're not on campus and you can't take advantage of the sports center for the exercise equipment, you can take advantage of the library. You can take advantage of other classes and courses offered. Um, they're not always necessarily going to be part of our tuition because our tuition is like a flat fee for our program because we have a prescribed curriculum that we have you take throughout those 26 months. And so we don't charge per credit because we're telling you what to take when, but you could always add on stuff because you're a student at the university. Um, and so, yeah, there are other, like the library resources are vast and so much of it is online now and people are constantly doing reciprocal things with their local library and our library to get materials and research projects. You know, so there's definitely a lot of tools that are at your disposal. And then when you are in town for the summer residency in particular, you do have use of the studios at the Hartford Arts School. So we've had people take advantage of the fact that like we have a really cool CNC router and a water blasting machine and, you know, a clay studio and all of that stuff. So um, printmaking studio, photography studio, the print labs, you know, that's definitely, again, like we are part of a university, even though we're low res. And so you do get to have some of those things. It's not the same as if you were like at a residential program. I mean, it's it's a different animal, but yeah, there's definitely options. So I will give you, does that work? Is that a good start? Okay. <laughs> um, Monica has her hand raised with the little button. Hello, everybody. Hi. Well, Hi. Um, I do also work full-time as a professor in a university here in Barranquilla, Colombia, where I live. So, um, now, one of the questions has been solved. You don't care about age so much, right? But then there's another practical question. If I have a PhD, do I have to show my undergraduate from 1970 or 80? No, no so you can show your master's or your doctorate. But you, I have to show the courses, not only the diploma. Um. I might, uh, let me ask, let me ask grad admissions. Cause I, yeah, like at the same time, if you show me a diploma, like, come on, I'm not gonna argue with that. You know, we might be able to accept that. But yeah, the, at worst case scenario, they'd wanna see a transcript from one of your other degrees, but no, don't, if you have an advanced, that, that goes for anyone. If you already have a master's, cause we've had people who do like, this is their second master's, just show us your master's, that's fine. <laughs> Okay, master's and PhD. There you go. That's you're awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Of course. And then I think I saw Mallory's hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, to go off the second on um, the question before, I was thinking um, just about in terms of like master's programs and like understanding what resources are available to you. Um, speaking for myself, I'm in New York City where space is uh, hard to come by. And so um, I saw on the list actually that, you know, it's when it said this program is good for folks who it says have a space to work already. And um, I just know that would be kind of a barrier for me. So I'm wondering if there's been 
precedent for folks um, who work with like faculty to, to secure a secure space because I also know like um, affordable residency options that offer that are like don't really um, don't really want folks who are in their MFA so just if you could speak a little bit about what that has looked like in the past. Yeah, um, I can I can say two quick things and then I bet Mary even has some more insight into this. Um, yes, we I can think of one in particular student who worked with her local college that she lived near to set up a working relationship. So she was actually, um, I don't even know exactly how she did it, but she almost got like a TA thing through them and was able to then use the studios locally. Um, the other thing is that a space is also very dependent on your practice. You know, we have, we've had a couple people who are muralists, you know, it's like that's, the, their space is out in the world. You know, um, having a studio at home isn't necessarily going to do anything for their art practice. So it, a lot of it depends on what your practices and what you want to bring to the table and how you adapt to those things. So that's also a factor, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. And then, yeah, Mary, do you have yeah, I mean, there's there are a lot of examples and it's thank you for the question, because it's something that I think has come up a few times this year. Um, and we are working on ways to to see that at Hartford. Um, I will also say that there have been creative solutions between uh, professors and students, between um, the, the larger community of Nomad as a whole and figuring out ways to work like I'm thinking about. Roberta, who is a current student who is based in New York City and who's working with mycelium and like in biological contaminants essentially and cannot do that from home and it has been trying to until we work something out and so we're fine we're able to find creative solutions they're just different um, for different circumstances. Does that help I know that's not like a clean cut <laughs> answer but yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and Brooke has your little hand raisey thing. Yeah. Hi, everybody. A couple questions. Um, well, you mentioned that folks could have access when they're in town to um, the studios in Hartford, and I actually live just a few minutes away. And so just wanted to confirm that you could have like ongoing <laughs> access, not just like once in a while. But secondly, you also mentioned earlier um just flexibility around people's lives and you mentioned people having a baby and I wanted to ask about the um the limits uh not limits but like the recommendation to send in a portfolio within the last four years because exactly four years ago I popped out a baby which has made the last four years a little bit more challenging for creating the kind of work that I would want to to um you know put in the portfolio um so just those are a couple of my questions yeah thank you yeah Absolutely. So um, yeah, and I actually totally forgot about Grace. Grace was actually totally pregnant while mm -hmm. on residency and then had a newborn baby for the next residency. She gave birth right in between the two. Um, and so she actually like was climbing a mountain with us, like a literal, like, like, like mountainous terrain, like being six months pregnant. I don't know how the heck she did it, but like she, she was the, the program fastest. She was pregnant. Um, so yeah, I think so with the studios at Hartford, the thing is that during the semester, we have to work with the undergrads who are there, you know, like you, we have, they have their studio times, they have their classes. However, if the studios are open and available, like there's just the work time at night from, you know, seven to midnight when the studios are open. Yeah. If we know in advance that you're coming, we put you on the access list, you know, and that's a kind of more of a COVID thing right now. Cause like campus is restricted right now but yeah like once you're a student you have a student ID if we know you're coming because this has happened before too with people like coming from New York City who wanted to come before a residency to like use the big format the large format printers or you know whatever they wanted to do yes you just work with our little MFA office we help coordinate that we can get you on campus I don't we've never had a scenario where we've had people leave stuff there. They've just come to work and then, you know, like have their space at home. But yes, the facilities are there. You pay a lab fee. It goes towards all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, you would just work with us to kind of coordinate that stuff. Um, and yeah, the letter of intent is again, a place where I would really explain that and just be like, yeah, this is my older work. 
popped out a baby. And now this is what I want to do for the next chapter of my practice. And I think that makes perfect sense. I think we have, you know, a committee who will completely understand that that's real life. And yeah, just, just, just explain, just be open. Communication's great. Monica, do you have another question? Yes. Um, do you have recommendations for the recommendation letters? Because usually, I don't know, you do it with a professor or somebody like that, but I'm older, I'm, I'm usually the professor, or I haven't had a mentor in years. So what do you recommend? Maybe a fellow artist or a producer? I think a peer, a fellow artist is, is great um there yeah there are no really no rules for who you should be from so i think that that would work really well yeah the only thing that i know we've kind of said in the past is people who can speak to your preparedness for the program and so i think you know from you know being a professor any colleague that you've worked with over the years who can speak to what you do and the quality of what you do and where you want to go and that they see that this is a good fit for you i think that would be completely applicable great thanks you're welcome ellie do you have something else um yeah i thought i saw on the website that housing is not included in the tuition so how does that work so that kind of depends on where we're going and what we're doing um so a lot of times when we, and this is so hard because of COVID, because we had a routine that was working great and then it got thrown out the window. So like once upon a time, when we came to Hartford, we had the option of staying on campus and it was really convenient. And yeah, they're undergrad dorms and they're really uncomfortable beds, but like you're in walking distance from class and it was easy. But then we weren't allowed to do that this past summer. And so everyone just had to find their own Airbnb. But also like the university has hotel discounts locally, you know, for prospective students to come in. So people were able to take advantage of that. Um, sometimes depending on where we go, we set up a discounted housing, you know, like a hotel, like a group rate at a hotel and people can choose to do that. Or yeah, like we have people who literally like camp in their vans or like take an Airbnb together as a whole cohort. So um, it, it's very much dependent on where we go. And the cost also varies simply because, you know, Miami costs different than rural New Mexico, you know. Um, but yeah, we try our best to support the students along the way, take as much of the burden out of like finding, like we'll give you a central location and say, we're going to be right around here for classes. So you should look right around here for housing with your cohort mates, you know? So we try and guide you. We try and get deals when we can, but yeah, the, like generally the food, the housing and the transportation is on you. There are definitely exceptions to that rule when we are doing things together, you know, and we work that out. All right. Thanks. I also, Trevor, you had a hand, but then it went away. Do you still have a hand? You're good? Okay. <laughs> um, are there scholarships through Hartford for past students that past students have been awarded? I'm not sure I understand. Like, so we I... have our merit scholarships that we give out from the program. And then, yeah, like people apply for other grants and other scholarships and you could totally apply that to your bill. And honestly, most people take loans. Like that's a very common thing amongst grad students in general. Um, but are you asking are about like specific, specific yeah. ones for Hartford University? Is there any like kind of teamwork there to um, secure those funds? So, okay. So we are part of the university. And so you can work with the financial aid office at the university for all of that stuff. So the, so if we award you a merit scholarship, you know, to come to the program, that's something that also goes through the financial aid office. If you want to take a loan, they have you fill out the FAFSA, 
they do that through financial aid and then they apply it to your bill and then you pay your bill through the bursar, you know? And so, yeah, if there are any other scholar, like, yeah, there are scholarships that you can apply for. Um, there's definitely a specifically a one for women. There's specifically a one for people who are alumni. There's, you know, like they have scholarships that they, that the university has that you can apply for. The only ones that we give out are the merit-based ones for our students, but yes, any you could if you are applicable for another award, rock on, go get it, bring it over here. They'll they'll work with you on the logistics of that. Brooke, did you have something else? Yeah, I thought I'd ask something that was less logistical and just more um, pedagogical. Um, this is the first MFA program that I've read about that I've been like, oh, you know, this is amazing. You know, and so I was just really curious because I'm not aware of other programs that are interdisciplinary in nature. Um, that well, they don't even have to be low residency, but I was just interested in like what what other programs are out there that um, this program is potentially connected to or has grown out of and has been inspired by, you know, what are, what is sort of that landscape look like? I'm just curious. I'm going to leave that to you, Mary. You yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think maybe California College of Arts is, is one. Um, um, we were also inspired by University of New Mexico. They have an arts and ecologies program that we were looking at. Um, Ernesto Pujol also was a um, inspiration in some ways as teaching and learning methods and he teaches at a bunch of places. I'd say there, there are many writers who uh, Carol looked to when she was designing the program, including Linda Weintraub and people we work with. But yeah, I think that's a, a great list. I, and if you've ever heard of, um, it's Black Mountain College, right? That's that one that was that experimental crazy thing that's no longer around. That was definitely something too. And, you know, when Carol kind of tells her little story about how she kind of came to this program, it was that there weren't any programs that really dealt with the issues that artists face today in a way that she thought was sufficient. You know, there were programs that are like art and ecology or social practice, but they're they're more siloed and they're not as interdisciplinary. And so she really saw that as a need. And so actually, since we started the program, there have been some other programs who have kind of started into this realm. Um, I think TransArt had one, but then they might've disbanded it. I don't really remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think we are unique because I don't think that I've come across another low res that travels that is this interdisciplinary. I think that is actually kind of a unique it is, yeah. intersection. Um, and you will find like those components in other places, but you're not going to find them all together from what I've experienced. And just like when you are the right person for this program, you know that you're the right person for this program. You know, we've had people who have said like, oh, I never thought I was ever gonna go to grad school. And then I read this and I was like, oh my God, this program was written for me. And like, we've had that more than once. Like we've had people like that in almost every cohort. And it's true. Like when, when you're like, dude, this matches what I wanted. Like it's pretty magical. And like those students are obviously my favorite, um, but yeah, I think, I think we are unique in a lot of ways. So yeah, I think just to add to that, I think that um, a field-based program is, it, there isn't another one that's like this, that, that is an MFA low. Um, so I think that another thing that that allows us to do that's really interesting is to have a teacher of record um, as, a, as opposed, so a distinguished practitioner can come in who has a different background um, and a teacher of record is oversees the course. So that's how I think the, in a university setting, we can do the kind of work that we're doing. So it's pretty, yeah, it's, a, it's pretty uh, <laughs> unique. Yeah, one of, uh, so just because we're doing it now. So Roxanne Swensel, she's this amazing, ceramist from out in New Mexico. She's an indigenous um, member and very passionate about 
the food and the permaculture institute that she runs out there and she does not teach like she just doesn't and carol actually had to like call her and email her and call her and email her and then physically go visit her and like knock on her door and was like, no, 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 no. I want you to teach in my program. How can we make this happen? I'm serious. And like, it was this whole process. And like, now she's our BFF and we're going back again, you know? So we definitely have these people who are not normal in the classroom people Mm -hmm. because of this traveling thing, the, you know, the concepts, Mark Dion, like he doesn't teach like this other places. Linda Weintraub doesn't teach like this other places. So yeah, we're cool. That's really the bottom line is that we're just cooler than the other programs. Like just being honest. And Carla knows it very well. So if you have, you know, Carla has been with the program since the beginning and knows how cool it is. Mary has been with the program almost since the beginning. Didn't you come in in like the second year? The second year. Yeah, so she's been around a long time too. But yes, I've been more in the weeds. I've been on the trips for like the whole time and and Mary has come in for like the thesis advising part of each trip more often. But now she's just diving right into the deep end with me. (laughs) and I'm taking her along for the ride. But yeah, if there are any other like logistical questions or like things about the residencies, we're here, we can answer them. If you think of something at two in the morning, just shoot us an email. All right, we are coming up on an hour. So any other last questions that anyone has before we say goodbye and then I'll email you all the waiver code. You're welcome, Mallory. Going once. Thank you. I think everyone's good. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for listening to us talk about this program that we obviously love and love working for. And we hope you join us. It's a good, it's a good time, man. We have fun. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, MFA at Hartford.edu. Email us if you have anything. I'll send you all the link to the recording and the waiver code probably tomorrow. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.